automobility. Automobility is a really rich and deep topic for two reasons. The first reason is it's one of the most important forces operating on architecture and urban form in human history. Surprisingly, the history of teaching about cities to architects almost never dives into the impacts of the automobile the way we're diving in. And it's really strange, and it's an interesting question. Why, what could be the reason why we don't talk about cars and the impact on the, on the, on the built environment? I'm just going to float that, unless you have an idea. Can you kind of just re repeat that? I kind of heard the beginning and the ending. Um, the automobile is the one of the largest forces no, 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 the in human history. The question is, why is it that we haven't studied the automobile in courses like this before now? Because it's always changing. It's a good theory. We're not going to settle it. I just want to, like, provoke you to think about why is it that automobility is invisible to architects? Because you sort of, if we're designing a building, we sort of only see it as like a person moving through, like through it, not so much a car or yeah. other forms of transportation. This is, this is getting at it. It's like fish, the, the uh, people who study fish culture, they realize that fish don't even have a word for water because right? they're in the water and so they don't even have a word to talk about water because they don't know anything but water. Technically fish don't have a word for anything but if they did have language they wouldn't have a word for water and uh, people who live in the Arctic they have 17 words for, the, for snow because it, it's life and death and we're going to try to be more like having 17 words for snow. We're going to look at the car as a force that's impacting the built environment. I feel like we kind of do actually focus, like study um, more like the automobiles within the city mm -hmm. um, or even in the outskirts. It's just not as giantly brought up until now, but mm -hmm. it is always in the back of our mind that we have to think about. It's in the back of our minds, exactly, yeah. Well, hold on, you know, strap in. This is going to be, this is going to, so the second thing, the second thing about the automobile is uh, it's an excellent way to get at how the design of a thing can have impacts beyond the thing. Like we always say that the design of architecture has impacts beyond the building itself. It deals with issues of culture. It deals with issues of economics and politics. It deals with how people experience the world. It, it, it changes. We, we talk about architecture as something that doesn't just supply space to satisfy very pragmatic needs, you know, functions and program, but architecture is all, also something that alters the way we experience the world, alters the way we think about the world. It actually has an impact on our mental structures how we think, and how we believe what we believe, how we come to believe what we believe. But sometimes if you always look at architecture and you're asking these questions, it gets very difficult and very confusing. So if the first way this topic is important is that it's transformed the built environment, the second way this topic is important is how, how to look at something that has impacts on everything. How to look at a, the design of a thing and try to figure out how it has impacts on the way we look at the world, the way we think. Our mental structures change as a result of the presence of this car in our lives. Right? So how many people went to high school? Raise your hand. Just checking to see if your hand works. Now put down your hand only if, keep your hand up, 
put down your hand if you did not drive to high school. With how many years? Put it down if you did not drive to high school. If you drove to high school, keep your hand up. At any point? Or? Yeah, like if there was a string of several weeks or months where you were one of the kids in high school who drove to school. Okay. Okay, now, for those of you with your hand up, why did you drive to school? You can put your hand down now. Thank you. Didn't have to wake up at 6.20 to go to like the bus stop. Yeah. That took an hour and a half to get to school. So it was more convenient, right? What else? Why else? We didn't have buses in our system. That was the only means of transportation with a 45-minute drive. Uh-huh. No buses. Mm -hmm. Okay. For me, it was because it was a 45-minute commute. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And no bus. Same thing. Now, what did that mean socially for you? Like, okay, take away the people who had no other options. What did it mean socially that you drove? Well, it's, uh, it's like that socially, it's, there's a social status behind driving instead of taking the bus. Yeah. So, uh, driving, having access to a car and using it to get to school in high school, which is where we learn a lot about how the world is constructed socially, um, for better or worse. Right? High school is hell, social hell for, for most people. But uh, for better or worse, uh, driving to school establishes who you are socially. It places you in a social hierarchy. And we learn, like now we know, uh, with very absolute clarity. We don't have to think about it. We know who the winners and losers are in society. Right? When we, when we go past the bus stop and we see people waiting at the bus stop, we know, we know that those people are losers. Right? Even in Boston, where the bus system is fairly good, we know that uh, those people are losers. That's just the way it works. And the people who drive are winners. Uh, that's just welcome to the United States. In Boston, it's a little different than the rest of the country because we have one of the highest rates of walking or bicycling to work of any place in the United States. Um, other places, uh, places where you grew up uh, and went to high school, probably there is no bus, right? Is there a bus system? There is a bus system in some of the places you went to high school. But how many of you went to high school in a place where there was no bus system available to you? Outside of the like school bus system? Outside of the school bus system. There's just no public transportation. Yeah, welcome to the United States. So uh, this, the, the automo this topic of automobility and Notice that we take the word automobile and we extend it. What's the difference between an automobile and the concept of automobility? If that was in the reading. What, what's the difference between those two things? What, what's, why add that itty thing at the end? Like we do this. We have modern and then we have modernity. And then we have reflexes and then we have reflexivity. That's the hardest one. All-encompassing, whereas automobile is just an object. Yeah, automobile is the object. Automobility is the system, and it goes beyond the system. Automobility is uh, our way. If we think about automobility, we have to include not just the system of automobility, which includes everything that was listed in the reading, the entire petrochemical industry the entire military industrial complex that says we're going to invade Iraq uh, and get control of those oil fields. Uh, we're about to invade Venezuela to get control of their oil fields. Right? So if we do that, it won't be because we're taking care of business in our hemisphere. It's to get control of those oil fields. So automobility is more than just a system. It goes much deeper. It penetrates into our mental structures. 
like our ability to identify winners and losers in society. And that becomes a cultural impact. So it moves from the design of an object to the design of a system to the design of a culture. Designs impact up those lines. And so when you get to the thesis program, if any of you are interested in going to the thesis program uh, in your final year of the graduate program, you'll basically be reconstructing this in reverse. You'll be saying, okay, what are the cultural, what aspects of culture uh, am I interested in? How do cultures change and shift and get transformed by changes, design changes to systems? And then what architectural scale design can I develop that Remember, it's all when you get to studio, it's all about what is the architecture doing and how is the architecture doing it. So what can I design that will have an impact on larger systems that might possibly have an impact on larger cultural forces? That's the goal. And that's what architecture does. Architecture is extremely powerful, and I'm I'm reversing what I was taught when I was in school. When I was in school, I was taught that architecture has no power except to inspire and impress uh, and make artistic statements. It has no real operative instrumental uh, utility. It's just, we're just a passive reflection of the forces in the world. And, but I was, I understood uh, very clearly that uh, my professors, even if they didn't get it, they're number four. And they're doing the best they can to take me as far as they can take me. But my job is to learn what I need to be successful in the world. And so your schooling can take you up to here. Your job is to take care of your education which is beyond what your schooling provides. So I'm, I'm flipping this whole thing, and I'm saying right up front, the first thing I said to you is I'm number four. I'm going to do the best I can. But that's not good enough. You are responsible for your education. And so you have to take what we offer you, and you have to build on that and get what you can out of this time and expense um, to get as far as you can. So... Who's with me? We love cars. Raise your hand if you love cars. Okay, we hate cars. Who's with me? Raise your other hand if you hate cars. How many people raised your hand both times? Why? It's a love-hate relationship. What's the... I love it when I can go long distances or when I need to feel like it's my own space and it's a great way of transportation without having to pay for public transportation. Needs like frequent stops, basically like from point A to point B in my own path. Mm -hmm. The negative part about it is really bad for our economy. It's the reason why we have a lot of pollution in the air. And people who do have cars, and when you're walking around the streets, it's a very dangerous hazard. More people die in car accidents than anything else. So mm -hmm. more of like a dangerous threat as well as like the loving places that you can go to. So is that okay? For the economy? For the economy, no. I would feel like it's not. Well, uh, it depends on how you measure the economy. If you are using conventional measurements, which is the sum, to, like gross domestic product, the sum total of all goods and services, also all the bads and disservices. We don't, we don't distinguish between goods and bads. We don't distinguish between services and disservices. Going to war goes into the same category as uh, educating uh, all the school-age children in the country. Right? We add those two things together. One is a tremendous good, and one is a tremendous bad. Right? But we don't make the distinction. So when, we, uh, when every year that the miles driven goes up, it registers in tons and tons of dollars uh, that get pumped into the economy. 
for steel and the production of cars and insurance industry, and but also uh, the medical costs of the uh, 30,000 people who are killed in car accidents. Is that every month? Mm -hmm. So all the costs, uh, the time lost at work, all the traffic jams, all of the potholes, all of that, they're, they're, we measure it, the more good that happens, the higher that number goes. And the more bad that happens, we don't deduct it, the higher the number goes. So who knows? The way we measure economic uh, good is doesn't, doesn't register goods versus bads, services versus disservices. It's all as if it's all good, right? So it's one of the flaws in economic measurements. But some would argue that traffic fatalities, traffic jams, et cetera, should be deducted, and it's actually bad for the world. But that's radical economics. Uh, so the point here that Emma really well uh, captured is despite everything that uh, we're about to learn, the cars, by some measurements, is one of the most successful human endeavors in human history. We have never had so much freedom and so much uh, mobility. Like We can do things and go places, and by we I mean people in the United States, because we were way ahead of the curve. We are who we are because uh, Henry Ford developed the car and mass produced it and brought down the cost of the car. And we could suddenly, not just, but first it was just doctors making house calls so they could help people more. But then increasingly the, the costs went down so much and the wages and income of people went so high uh, that uh, cars could be, you know, every family in the U.S., uh, the car ownership rate is, came very close at a certain point to 800 cars per thousand people. Amazing high-level, historic, record-breaking car ownership rates. And so people had access to things. Not everyone could drive. Children, handicapped, uh, elderly, but everyone else. It excluded very few people. It was a very widespread benefit, and it was tremendously successful. But as all things that are tremendously successful, there are unintended consequences that because we did not have reflexive system behaviors, we don't know what to do now because we can't adjust fast enough to head off unintended consequences like traffic deaths. We're trying but it's very slow and sluggish to make the changes we need to make to reduce traffic deaths. And then the big one, the thing, remember the thing? What's the thing Rob was talking about? The planet. We only have one planet, and it's, it's about to fail. It, it's, it's not failing on its own terms. It's going to fail to support multiple species. We're entering the sixth extinction phase of global history, of Earth geological time. Uh, this is the sixth extinction, um, where thousands of species are going extinct at a record rate. And one of the species that's highly at risk is the human species. So that's a downside. I Call me crazy, but I like the idea that humans will continue, that my children and their children's children will continue. Some of you may have it argue from a different point of view, but I think uh, I'm comfortable supporting the idea that the ongoing preservation of the human species is, would be a good thing if we can do it without killing all the other species. Right? I don't want to get all metaphilosophical about whether it would be good for the human species to go extinct. You save that for your dorm room discussions late at night. Right? That's so, what is automobile dependency? How does automobile dependency do what it do, does? And how does automobile dependency reproduce itself? Like, why is it that every generation 
that is born into and experiences life uh, in the world uh, emerges uh, at about your age and says, cars, I'm going to have a car. How many people own a car? How many people will own a car uh, five years from now? No, if you own a car, I mean, how many people who currently own a car will continue to own a car? So five years from now, how many people are going to have a car? Oh, really? So you own a car now, and five years from now, you're not going to own a car. How does that work? You live in the city. You're going to live in the city. And so it's, is it, how important is it to you to not own a car? Money? Because you have student loans? You know how in the car ads it says uh, $3,000 down, $190 a month, right? They have those ads. What would that ad look like if it were for your college education? How much a month? And how much are you going to be making as an architect? And how much do you have left over after rent, food, student loans? Do you have enough left over for that car payment? Is that what you're thinking? No. Um, after the payment, the first payment you made to own a car, it continues to, in cities like Boston, you got to pay for your parking, your insurance becomes higher, mm -hmm. you got to maintain your car, you got to do your all the chains, all this stuff, when you add them together, at the end of the year, bill becomes uh, unbelievable. How much is it? It's a lot. Hmm? I kind of was going to move forward. Or well, let's first get, how much is it a month? I mean, how much is it a year to own a car in the United Depends States? On the car. Depends on the city. The average in the United States is $8,000 a year. Yeah. So calculate that into your thinking. But the average place in the United States is not Boston. It could be twice that. Um, do you know anyone who has never owned a car and will never own a car? Are you one of those people? So what's going on? Why? Um, I've been living in the cities except when I was in New Jersey mm -hmm. for the high school period. So that was the only time period that I actually had to ask my friend to drive to school. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I've been living in the city areas and I didn't really need a car mm -hmm. and right now I'm living in a school zone which means like unless I'm I want to travel to somewhere so you're committed to going through life yes. never owning a car and I do have a negative impact I yeah. have image of the car itself too yeah I'm someone I love cars uh, I've driven across the country multiple times in a borrowed car I take apart engines I used to, to cross the country a couple times um, but I claim to have never owned a car in part because I was away in Sumatra after the tsunami for like six weeks and I came home and my wife had bought a car and nothing to do with me. If I'd been there, I would have argued against it. So I benefit from being married to someone who owns a car. And every year we go camping and I'm very grateful that she bought her car when we go camping because we used to rent a car every year to go camping. It was like $450 to rent a car. And when she, I was away, she bought a car for $1,000. It was like brilliant. Um, so, but I've never owned a car. And I've never uh, driven to Wentworth, uh, except I guess Uber counts during snowstorms. But I bicycle. I'm very Dutch about these things. So let's get into it. There's a lot of topics that we have to cover. Because as I said, this is a deep, deep topic. And some of them are things that people study when they study cities, like Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. You ever heard of the name Jane Jacobs? You've heard the name Jane Jacobs? I've heard of it. <laughs> You've heard the name Jane Jacobs? So have you, as your studio professor, ever said, eyes on the street? defensible space, eyes on the street, you want to, does, you, does that ring a bell, eyes on the street? Okay, we'll get into it. This is an important topic. There's so many important things. And so along this lines of we do the best we can, but don't think for a second that what I'm telling you now is good enough for your education. I'm giving you this outline 
and I'm going to taunt you with exposure to a few ideas. It's your job to aggressively go in here and say, streetcar suburbs, I think I get it. I don't need to know anything more. Fordism, I got it. Uh, Futurama, that's interesting. I think I want to dig into that more deeply because that's very architectural. Uh, or oh, white flight. I'm really interested in how the mechanisms of racism operate. And you know, I was interested in LA school, I'm, and I'm really kind of intrigued by how racism is reproduced through architectural means. So I'm going to go back. So this is an outline. This is a menu of topics, detailed topics within this larger topic. That your job is to identify which ones resonate with you, feel important. And you're going to have to go back. And I apologize, because we don't have time. I used to teach a full semester course just on this topic. And we didn't have time. And now it's squeezed into a short lecture. So let's go streetcar suburbs. So streetcar suburbs is what happened in the United States uh, before the automobile boom, is that as cities grew in population in the United States, uh, their uh, land developers, in order to in order to sell real estate, they would buy land, they would buy farmland for like a dollar a lot. They'd buy this really cheap farmland. And uh, it was cheap because it was too far from the city to get there. So they would buy land for a dollar a lot. They would invest in laying down rails in the middle of the street. And they would um, hire these guys to run streetcars back and forth from downtown into these newly laid out neighborhoods where there'd be shopping along the street and there'd be houses here and people could come out of their houses walk to the main street they could shop and do whatever but then they'd get on the streetcar and the men would go to work the white men would go to work um, see how I did that uh, so that was the pattern the value of the land would go from one dollar to a hundred dollars just because now uh, I can get to work. And so the streetcar uh, cost, whatever it cost, it's like five dollars of every lot went to the streetcar. Uh, Seventy dollars of every lot went to building the house. Right? So the house was the big cost, was building the house. The streetcar was trivial in terms of cost. And that's how streetcars were financed. And uh, we live in a streetcar suburb here. Boston is a city surrounded by streetcar suburbs. Roxbury is a streetcar suburb. Dudley Square, Dorchester, Brookline, Brighton. Uh, all, of, all of these towns that were annexed and swallowed up by the expanding city of Boston all of this area was streetcar suburbs. And it wasn't just Boston. It was every city in the United States. And it wasn't just every city in the United States. It was every city in the world developed in this way. Throughout Asia, throughout Africa, throughout, uh, you name it, Latin America, streetcar suburbs was the way that cities expanded. And around every city today, you can go anywhere in the world to any city and you can say, ah, I recognize this pattern. This is a streetcar suburb. It's a, a radial line going out of the downtown grid where perpendicular to that line, there are streets that look like this and they're close together so you can maximize the number of people. Because for streetcar suburbs to make sense, it has to take me less than 10, 15, 20 minutes to walk to the streetcar. And then uh, it has to be less than a half hour to get to the city. So in that walking zone and in that streetcar zone of about a half hour to 40, 30 to 40 minute commuting time, 
that's where the streetcar suburbs are around every city in the world. And they developed between the 1880s and the 1820s. And so you are now uh, readers of the world. You can go to any city in the world and you can impress your friends and loved ones. And you can say, yeah, streetcar suburb. It was built uh, between 1880 and 1820, 1830. You'll say, how did you know this? And you can say, architect. Wentworth, I went to Wentworth, right? 1880 to 1830? Or? 1830, because the crash happened in, uh, I mean 1930. The crash happened in 1929, and we stopped building everywhere in the world. And you can get, if you want to get even more detailed, uh, from 1880 to 1910, there were business cycles of bankruptcy, boom, bankruptcy, boom. It would be like four years of boom, and that's when all the houses were built in Brookline. All the houses were built in the South End. Uh, you can pinpoint those dates by the pattern of brick, uh, the details of the windows. Is there arch over the window, or is it a straight lintel? You can you can say with some degree of certainty that was built between 1880 and 1883. Arch windows, uh, the fact that it was built at all meant it was built during one of those short boom periods. Because between the boom periods, no one builds a thing. And when the next boom comes, they change the window details of the material or the style or the spacing. It's really remarkable how precisely you can pinpoint these things. Um, this is St. Paul, Minneapolis. These are the streetcar lines. This is the pattern that we're looking for uh, when we're looking for streetcar suburb. Um, the man who wrote the book on streetcar suburbs is Sam Bass Warner. He used to teach at BU. I used to see him hanging out in the MIT library, and he wrote the book, Streetcar Suburbs. He was writing it about Brookline and the Boston area, but it really presented to the world the DNA uh, of how cities uh, developed in this period. See the date 1914? It's still booming. It's coming to the end of its time. And what's this? So Los Angeles. We talked about Los Angeles, I think. Yeah. Um, no, they, they had to build uh, subways at some enormous, crazy, insane cost. Uh, because before that, no one uh, walks in L.A., which is a famous song from the 1970s. Do you guys know this music? Nobody walks in L.A.? So it used to be that nobody walks in L.A., but now they have subways and buses, and so now people walk in L.A., but before that, no one had ever done anything but drive in L.A., right? Wrong. L.A. had the most extensive mass transit network in the world in the 1920s. What happened? How could LA, which is famous for having no way to, no way to get around but cars, how could it have been as recently as 100 years ago, how could it have been the biggest mass transit network in the whole world? Crazy, right? Any ideas? We'll come back. So then what happened? 1908, Henry Ford uh, figures out a way to mass produce automobiles, which ex uh, dramatically drops the cost of every car. Prior to that, every car that existed prior to 1908, uh, every car that existed was built in a shop, one at a time. It was built like a piece of furniture. It was built like houses are built today. Right, uh, But then he said, hey, let's mass produce this. And you may have learned in your humanities and social science classes about this thing called Fordism. Did you learn about this thing called Fordism? Well, they might have taught you that Fordism is the idea that mass production reduces the cost of things and it makes for happier consumers because the cost goes down and now I can afford a car, right? But that's only half the picture. 
The other picture, which capitalism, capitalist ideology doesn't want us to know that that's the trivial part of Fordism. The single most important aspect of Fordism, after bringing down the cost of the automobile, Ford, who had some radical ideas about society, he didn't want to just make money building cars, which of course he wanted to make money building cars. He also wanted to impact the world in a positive way. So he said, how about this? You guys, I'm going to, the, going, the going wage is a dollar a day. Inflation has changed things. He says, I'm going to give you $3 a day. I'm going to pay you enough. I'm going to overpay you. I'm going to totally destroy the, the market for labor in the cities where I'm producing these things, Detroit. Uh, by inflating your wages, and I'm going to be called a, a traitor to the capitalist class because I'm, I'm artificially inflating wages for all my workers because I don't want, I can't just produce cars. My ability to produce cars is limited by the ability of people to buy the cars. I don't want to just produce a supply of cars. I want to produce a demand for cars. So I'm going to produce workers. The thousands of people that are going to be employed in my factories, I want them to buy the cars that they're making. If I can inflate the wages of the workers, uh, then I can create a market and I can make more cars. If I can distort the labor economy of the United States, I can force all manufacturers to boost the wages of their workers, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flood society with cars. And I'm going to do it by having a positive impact. I'm going to create a middle class. That's Fordism. He didn't just increase the supply, he increased the demand by socially engineering, deliberately inflating the wages of his workers. Right? This answers so many questions that we were talking about in the past few weeks. Right? How do these reflexive market mechanisms operate? And uh, what is the relationship? Uh, it, it gets to this question of the, the, uh, the job creators. Right? The job creators, uh, a, a billionaire buys three pair of blue jeans and he's good. Right? And he doesn't create any more jobs than any one of us, because three pairs of blue jeans, that's all I can afford, right? That's all I need. Um, so the way you boost the economy and create more jobs is you put money in the hands of people who are actually going to spend it and not just uh, hide it away in uh, investments, money laundering schemes in the Cayman Islands or Dubai real estate. So that's Fordism. This next topic, I'm going to buzz through because we're going to deal with it next week. We're going to talk about how architects' dreams were altered by the automobile. So there's this idea of the linear city that is a streetcar suburb idea. That if you create the transportation infrastructure, which tends to occur in a line, and then give people access to that, you create this fat line that can go through the landscape, and that's the pattern of urban expansion. It worked for the streetcar suburb, so you saw that pattern uh, on the landscape. It also works for other transportation infrastructure. So you see uh, the, the uh, railway system cutting across the United States and developing the land and the towns along the way, where every place there's a station stop. Same thing happens with other things like roads. And so you see roads developing as the core of urban expansion off that core. We also saw it briefly when we looked at the Dutch planning for the island of Java, where they said, listen, you're not going to be able to control where people build because it's Indonesia. Uh, why don't you supply uh, the infrastructure along a corridor so that there's an incentive for people to develop near that infrastructure? And so you can determine the land use pattern of a landscape by your decisions to supply infrastructure, and that is water supply, electricity supply, internet, 
these days. Uh, roads, trains, everything. You can control the pattern of urban development by controlling the pattern of infrastructure. And that was what was going on here. This is a, a guy named Le Corbusier. Have you heard of him? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, he said, the freeway is a building. And you stop along the freeway and you go down and your main commercial things are just below the, the road. And then your housing is in a wall below that. Crazy talk, right? This is the French colony of Algiers in Algeria. They fought a war in the 60s to, control, to keep control of it. And you arrive at the government office building by driving off the raised topography of the coastal mountain range. You stay high and you drive and you park on the roof and you go to work. So it's establishing a new datum plane where life happens above the ground because life happens where the roads are. A city designed for speed is a city designed for success. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to this next, next week. Now here's a real, um, a real game changer that was the vision of an architect. Uh, in 1929, there's the Great Depression, and we stop everything. We stop building, we stop, you know, people lose their jobs. There's a huge, it's the largest financial collapse in modern history. Uh, second, the second one was 2007. Um, and so this is the World's Fair in 1939. We're still trying to struggle to claw our way out of the depression. Uh, Hitler has taken over Germany and he invented this really awesome thing called the Autobahn. So Hitler, he flunked out of architecture school. Was it architecture school or art school? Well, it was art school, but he wanted to be an architect. That was, you know, there's two paths in the European model. You can go to technical architecture school, or you can go to art architecture school. He was going to the art architecture uh, path, and he was not accepted to the architecture program. Uh, and, but he was still, you know, he was a designer, and he said, and arguably he invented the freeway in the German Autobahn. He designed the Volkswagen Beetle. He designed the flag. He designed the uniform. Uh, he designed the spectacle of the searchlights going up. Uh, I'm not sure if we do this in a, another lecture, but just in case. So this is what's happening in 1939. He's taking over Germany. He's become the absolute dictator of Germany at this point. Uh, and he has this cool Autobahn idea. Uh, and so we say, hey, well not we, General Motors, the competition for Ford, General Motors said, hey, at a certain point, we're going to get back into the business of building things. And when we do, we want it to be a, a future that is entirely dependent, or takes, they didn't say that, they said, we want to envision and build a future that takes full advantage of the miracle that is automobile and automobility. And so they spent a fortune in the 1939 World's Fair in Flushing Meadows, Queens, New York, to design a model, a huge model. There's the people, huge model. The traffic is all moving um, to say, this is what the future looks like. We're going to project way into the future, the year 1960. This is what the world could look like in, the, in 1960. Take a look. And uh, in downtowns, this is a model. Uh, the traffic will be below. The pedestrians will be separated safely above. And there will be no traffic deaths. And everything will be fine. that it really started was the 1939 World's Fair at what was the most successful World's Fair in history, the most successful exhibit 
was one called Futurama. To help us get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours that has been created for the New York World Fair, a thought-provoking exhibit of the developments ahead of us, a vivid tribute to the American scheme of living. Come, let's travel into the future. What will we see? Futurama portrayed the future of the city in that distant year, 1960. The world we are now seeing is a vision. It doesn't look so weird to us. Which may undergo Why many does it look so it weird? Into the great realities of tomorrow. And it portrayed a it city work. that was car-driven, lots of open spaces. You could live in the country and drive to your job downtown, and you'd have the best of two worlds. Over space man has begun to win victory suburban splendor and urban excitement uh not coincidentally futurama was sponsored by general motors and they were promoting what we wanted and it's my sense that 1939 just before the war the clouds are looming over europe we go off to war and we have this image that's mulling in our minds and we come back and we implement futurama 15 million GIs came back from the war, clamoring for new homes and a piece of land in the country. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. So, uh, the U.S. won the war by boosting its industrial capacity to produce uh, planes, Bombs, ships, jeeps, trucks, tanks, munitions, and that's how we won the war. So there's this enormous explosion of industrial activity which made the difference between uh, Man in the High Castle, right, I've mentioned it, great visualization of what happens if the Nazis get the bomb before we do. Um, uh, it made all the difference. But what happens when the war's over? What do you do with all that industrial capacity? And the answer was to shift it to suburban expansion. You uh, create an interstate highway system. You build houses, one a day is what the narrator is talking about, um, because it's a mass production system. And uh, you finance that, and you get people out into the suburbs, yes. The narrator also said that um, what caught my attention was um, he used the term suburbia, what we're entering into the suburbia. Is that, in, like, do we still have that, like, within today, and is that going to be important to show we focus on that as well? Well, uh, suburbia as we know it today is a product of the post-war boom that was the mobilization of industrial capacity that we developed during the war. There were streetcar suburbs prior to World War II, but after World War II, we just went crazy uh, with the expansion. And that's the place where most of us grew up, I think. Right? Suburbia? How many people grew up in a classic American suburb? Really? That's all? Maybe? Okay. So, um, now back to the streetcar. Have you seen uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's a good, it's funny, right? So who's the villain? And what, what is he, what was his evil plot that was revealed near the end of the Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Do you remember? So it takes place in Los Angeles. He says, I bought the red car so I could dismantle it, right? Typical evil genius, totally made up, that could never happen, right? Or could it? For the 
one in ten on an automobile uh, used right. Street cars. At that time, Alfred P. Sloan said, wait a minute. This is a great opportunity. I mean, we've, we've got 90% of the market out there that we can somehow turn into automobiles. It's 11 o'clock. We can eliminate the real alternatives. We will create a new market for our cars. And if we don't, then this whole, you know, the entire General Motors sales are just going to be, are going to be low. They had to get rid of the streetcars. They wanted the space that the streetcars used for automobiles. <laughs> Could be Boston. They had to find something they could put in place for the streetcar. Sloan had the concept that he wanted to somehow motorize all the major cities of the country. That meant uh, replacing all the street railways with buses. And ultimately thinking that no one would want to ride the buses and therefore they buy General Motors automobiles. Evil. Sloan wanted to get it very big in this field. What he bought was phenomenal the largest bus operating company in the country, and the largest bus production company. And using that as a foothold, GM moved into Manhattan. They acquired interest in the New York railways, and between 1926 and 36, they methodically destroyed the rails. So every railway company, every railway line was a different company. When they were finally motorized New York, General Motors issued these, these ads throughout the country. This is important because they're trying to show that motorization is the wave of the future. They issued these ads and said, the motorization of Fourth and Madison is the most important and ethical event in the history of community transportation. In the mid-1930s, GM worked hard to create the impression of a nationwide trend away from rail. But there was no trend. Buses were a tough sell. They jolted, they smelled, they inched through traffic. City by city, it took a hidden hand of General Motors to replace streetcars with yellow coach buses. In 1936, a company was founded that would grow to dominate American city transportation. Started as two brothers in Minnesota. National City Lines had no visible connection to General Motors. In fact, the director of operations came from a GM subsidiary, Yellow Coach, and members of the board came from Greyhound, which was founded and controlled by General Motors. The money to start this new company also came from Greyhound and Yellow Coach. To hide these connections, the company needed a front man. Roy Fitzgerald got his start in northern Minnesota, where he hauled miners and school children in a couple of buses. General Motors would groom him to become president of National City Lines. Over the next few years, Standard Oil of California, Mack Truck, Phillips Petroleum, and Firestone Tire would join GM in backing this venture. All of a sudden, you get these fellows with the fedora hats, the spats. I'm not making that up. Uh, the two-tone shoes the broad ties, the black shirts, the white panamas. All of a sudden, they show up. And, of course, the word goes out, hey, we're being born. Fitzgerald, big name in buses. National City now in top place as operator of City Route Miles. Brian Moore is E. Roy Fitzgerald, who describes himself as one of five farm boys trying to run a few buses. The Fitzgeralds came in here just like they did in every city they ever went into. 83 cities in the United States. So they, they purchased the streetcars. The needs of the people. Well, the streetcars, we love right on them. And it was fun because they were big, you know, there's plenty of room and all that. 
we catch them at the same time every day. We know the same the conductor and you meet people that you see every day. And you weren't afraid to, to talk to someone. The speaker was fast, isn't it? He just jumped on the chairs like that, it was so fast. And then the conductor, every time he would come to cross, he'd go clink, 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 clink. To the car, I just thought, oh, yeah, Jay Klein, yeah. Yeah, I was here. <laughs> they were around when we were, when we were younger. <laughs> that was the best form of transportation. Then somebody had the bright idea to take up all the trash and get rid of all the trolleys. That's when the headache started. How long did it take you before the Fitzgerald started getting rid of the speaker? Uh, about 90 days. No, I'm, I'm not being facetious about that. Weren't those streetcars making money in Los Angeles? Well, after I got done chopping their heads off, they wouldn't make money. Cut the miles down. Sell off their properties. Pull the company down. They don't take the service out. They just cut it back. They'll take it and they'll cut it from 10 minutes to 12 minutes, from 12 to 15, from 15 Sound to, 20, familiar? to 20 to 30. So they reduce the service. And every time you reduce the service, you make it less attractive. And the less attractive, the less riders. And then they say, well, see, we can't make any money. So they abandon it. They don't just People abandon it, they sabotage it. It takes a lot of money to pull the tracks out of the street. If you don't need the people, what are you going to do? Keep them around for flies? There was people out there who was up for retirement. And you always get rid of the old ones first. And that's what we do. Why and Eric was just like everybody else of that particular ilk. All they were interested in doing was taking the money out. They sucked the system dry. They raised the fares. They skimmed every dime worth of everything they could get off of it. Basically, I'm better at what I've seen. Because if you take a fine tool of Rolls Royce, as an example, and give it to some shade tree mechanic and let him work on it, and he ruins it, you're going to be better about your rules. And that's what we had, was we had a Rolls Royce. We had the finest public transportation system we wanted. I think of anywhere in the country. In Los Angeles. Yeah. And in 10 years, that was just history. So long story short. 10 years, that was just, I think of anywhere in the country. And long story short, they didn't just uh, replace the trolleys, the streetcars with buses. They invested a great deal of money to remove the rails out of the street so it could never be resurrected. Then they didn't just put the streetcars in storage somewhere or sell them to uh, Japan or Southeast Asia where people were still using streetcars. They wanted to make sure that this mode of transportation would never come back. And so they put them in uh, places like this and they burned them. They were found guilty in a lawsuit, uh, the, 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 the several companies, and each company was fined $5,000 each, which used to be a lot of money, and the officers of the company were fined $1 each. And then they said, okay, and mission accomplished because they did eliminate the streetcars in most of the 83 cities where they targeted this takeover. One of the most successful cases was Los Angeles. The cost of replacing just one of the uh, 80 or so streetcar lines in Los Angeles is so astronomical that they've now vowed to never do it again. So we're done adding trains to Los Angeles. We're now, the, there was a lawsuit, they have to expand the bus system because it's so much more cost effective. So was this, uh, so th this is, and uh, the, in the reading, he uses cars as a way for us to understand how, how f uh, history uh, can go in any direction. We tend to look back in time. When we're looking backwards, we say, well, of course, the Romans were successful because uh, it was inevitable that the Romans would be successful. 
But when historians look at the Romans, they say, well, the Romans could have lost this battle and that would have been it for them. And they look at all the, the turning points in history where it could have turned out differently. You might say it was inevitable that uh, George W. Bush was elected president. Well, it wasn't so inevi inevitable. It really uh, turned on 590 votes in Florida that would have normally, under normal circumstances, there'd be a recount. But his brother Jeb Bush was governor, and the Republican uh, controller of the elections in Florida said, nope, we're not going to do a recount. It was an extraordinary move. Uh, against normal procedures. And the Supreme Court also um, said, nope, no recount. And so George W. Bush was president instead of Al Gore. We'd be in a different world today if that had gone a different way. Same thing with uh, Trump. If uh, Hillary Clinton had campaigned in Michigan or Wisconsin, there's a good chance that she would have won the election if Russia had not meddled in the, uh, in the social media etc. There's a good chance. And the most surprised person in the whole thing was Donald Trump himself. He never expected to be elected. So uh, in the reading, they say there were three power sources for automobile. It was steam, electric, and gasoline. And of those three, the least viable one was gasoline. But because of very subtle changes in, uh, in that in the, in the moment of truth, uh, they shifted towards gasoline. And every time someone tried to bring up a steam technology or an electric technology, it was squashed repeatedly. Every decade or two throughout the history of the automobile, someone, especially electricity, says, let's do it with electricity. And every time, the same uh, operators who squashed mass transit would squash the electric vehicle until recently. So now they're OK, and here we go with uh, electric vehicles. So we talked about LA school. Um, this is, in a way, taking another uh, wave through LA school history, because the automobile and the expansion of suburbs, the automobile suburb uh, after World War II, uh, was, a, was a big force in the establishment of racial segregation even though slavery ended uh, 100 years earlier. Uh, and so we talked about white flight. If you just do a simple search uh, on white flight in um, Wikipedia, you get this series of forces and methods and strategies that were all used to reproduce the social segregation that we had during slavery, uh, to reproduce it even though uh, slavery had been abolished after the Civil War. And so uh, this is something we're not going to dig into, uh, but the, the traces are all there. Uh, it was legal, just very quickly, it was legal to uh, for uh, up until 1965, it was legal to determine the racial content of who, you, who could live where. That was legal. Um, since 1965, you can't exclude people based on race. But up until 65, you could. And it was actually uh, US mortgage law policy said, give loans to white people, don't give loans to black people. That was part of the US government policy. That was legal. Roads, the, we'll get into the strategies for locating roads had a huge impact on devastating the community. Once you uh, restrict where non-whites can live, then you build roads through that neighborhood along the boundary to do two things. The first step is to reduce the size of that neighborhood. So you reduce the population of non-white people in the city. And you harden the boundary between white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. Uh, if you wanted to remove um, uh, a population. There was a trick called blockbusting. We don't have time to go into that. Urban renewal was one of the policies. Um, and then desegregation of the schools, especially here in Boston, was a serious thing. 
if and when do you want to go into this? This is a book um, that came out last year that really does a fantastic job of documenting how we created uh, pre-civil rights conditions after the end of um, restrictions on race. These are the famous redlining maps. Redlining is not really the right term. It's really red zoning. Um, we had zoning maps that said whites could live here, blacks could live here, that's it. But then that was, you can't do that. And so instead, for several decades, we had uh, highest quality housing, m uh, middle quality housing, and low quality housing. And that was uh, uh, a euphemism for race. And the, um, the impacts are still there. Here's Boston, and you can see Brookline, you can see Dorchester. It's all the patterns that were established. Uh, this map is from um, the 1930s, I think. But the patterns established during that period are still visible in the landscape today. There's the Detroit map. Yeah. Our humanities actually has a study in QGIS, which does basically all of this, but throughout the entire nation. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So you, have you seen Fisher's maps? Yeah. We outline like segregation from like, we're doing right now 1940s and 1980s. And it's not just Boston, it's the entire, or, um, the entire United States that we could use. Fantastic. Yeah, because that data is freshly available now. Robert Moses. So Robert Moses was uh, never elected to public office. He was appointed. <clears throat> and he uh, is credited with being the most powerful government official never elected to office. And he started, he, he's the one responsible for when the US um, argued in favor <clears throat> of the U.S. interstate highway system. First, let's go back. You know how lobbying, corporate lobbyists are altering the outcomes of government, of, of elections and government legislation? It's kind of a big, we just take it for granted now. That was invented in the 1930s and 40s by the automobile industry. For most of the 20th century, the largest lobbying interests in the US government were the automobile uh, industry leaders. They gave the most money to lobby uh, for re-elections of people. And so the laws were written in a way to favor the expansion of the automobile industry. Uh, John Sloan, the uh, CEO of General Motors, said famously, what is good for General Motors is good for the United States of America. And that was unquestioned. That was not a radical statement. It was just the way the world worked. And that's how the government worked. The government did what it could to benefit General Motors and the, the rest of the automobile industry. So when, uh, in 1954, they passed the Interstate Highway Act, this was part of the suburban the suburbanization of the United States, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to say, hey, we need to build suburbs outside of the city so we can resegregate uh, the United States. Um, they had to justify it in the end for military defense purposes. So the, the law to invest huge amounts of money in the interstate highway system to make it free uh, to travel further distances and make it more attractive to buy cars. It was passed because Eisenhower said, we need the interstate highway system to mobilize troops in case World War II happens again and we get attacked. We need to be able to move troops and tanks and logistics and personnel from sea to shining sea very quickly. And so we built the largest interstate highway system in human history at that point. Now China has outdone us. Uh, but the big question is, what do you do when you get to cities? And it was Robert Moses who said, you plow right through those cities. And that's what he did, starting with New York City. Um, culturally, the interstate highway system became 
a key part of the identity of the growing white middle class. In order to be a patriotic American in the post-war period, you needed to drive your family across the country uh, in these beautiful vehicles and see the national parks. Um, but back to Robert Moses. So basically, he took the, uh, the maps, the red line maps that said, here's where the low quality housing is, non-white people. Uh, he said, we're going to build the freeway where the economic value is the lowest. We're going to uh, expropriate those homes, and that's where we're going to build the freeway. Uh, and, and so those, those freeway location decisions had the impact of doing, as I said, reducing uh, the number of non-whites who lived in those neighborhoods, and then created a barrier uh, so that uh, the two communities would be segregated. Because there, there's one story that illustrates this quite well. There was a developer who wanted to build a neighborhood, uh, and he wanted to sell it at a very high value, uh, but he couldn't qualify for the loan because the location of the land that he was working on was adjacent to a non-white neighborhood. And so US banking practices prior to 1965 said, don't give money to a developer if he's building uh, houses next to uh, a low economic value neighborhood, non-white people. And he kept pushing. He said, no, I need the loan to develop this land. And they said, no, we can't give it to you. It's, it's against our rules. He said, uh, what if I build a wall between the new development and the black neighborhood? And they said, uh, no. And so he went ahead and he built the wall. It was one foot thick, seven feet high, and a half mile long. And it was very convincing. They came out, they looked at the wall, and they said, OK, we'll give you the loan. And so they, he could build it. And so it's a very vivid demonstration of how important it was as US government policy to segregate the races. And this was another way that that happened. Now, one of Robert Moses' big plans was to take the freeway system and cut it across Lower Manhattan through Greenwich Village, right through Washington Square Park. Do you know New York City? So right through where NYU is. So uh, there would be one at Canal Street and another one right through uh, Washington Square Park, another one at 42nd Street. This is the plan. And you need it to mobilize uh, the economy. And Jane Jacobs was uh, a lowly, first of all, she's a woman, right? Women don't know anything at this point in time, was what people would say. She uh, struggled through college. She struggled. She was an editor at uh, a magazine. And she liked to go to neighborhoods. She proposed that she do a series of articles where she goes to neighborhoods, looks at how the social, physical fabrics work together, and publish articles about that. But things happened, things changed. She lived in Greenwich Village. She said, um, and she lived on Hudson Street in Greenwich Village. Let's see where so Hudson Street in Greenwich Village. She lived over here. And um, this is a cartoon version of what is really a kind of a cool, dramatic face-off between Robert Moses, this super powerful man, mobilizing, the, you know, he was the China before China was China. He was mobilizing concrete and steel in a way nobody had ever done before. And here's this humble little housewife who happens to write this cute little article. She mobilizes uh, a movement, and she, long story short, she stops the highway. You know, she, she goes to court. She leads protests. She stopped him in his tracks. And she wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, one of the most important books on this topic uh, ever. Um, if you're looking for something to complete your incomplete education next summer, this is an excellent book for you to dip into. My friend asked me, he said, I'm thinking about writing a book about, uh, and I'm looking for the next book title. Uh, he's the one who wrote um, 
the movie that was about the mathematician, the Indian mathematician that they made a movie out of. And he had writ just written that, and he said, I'm looking for a new topic. And he, he said, well, what about Jane Jacobs? And I said, oh, God, she's, you know, forget it. Don't do Jane Jacobs. Well, fortunately, he ignored my advice. He wrote a book on Jane Jacobs, and now it's the definitive, uh, autobiog uh, the definitive biography of Jane Jacobs. And this is the eyes on the street. She was talking about her street on Hudson Street in Greenwich Village, New York. She said, when you have people hanging out on the street, you create safety, you create social well-being, you create uh, the kinds of relationships and connections that actually make places worth defending against things like freeways and worth taking care of and defending against things like criminal activity. And um, <clears throat> so this whole, it's basically a softer way to surveil. It's a social, it's a way of mobilizing social forces in a very positive manner. And so you take care of each other. You also do things like, remember the kampong, the informal settlements in Jakarta? We looked at how the women of the house could take care of their kids and sell meals and miscellaneouses out of the front of their home. It basically is this. The informal set, the genius of mixed uses inside the informal settlements of taking care of children while you're in your house selling things to your neighbors. She codified it uh, for United States cities that by keeping track of what's going on in the street, you actually create benefits. The story she tells in chapter 11, I think, in the book, she says, um, when I have friends coming from out of town, but I can't be home when they arrive, I go to the store uh, in my building, uh, and I give my keys to the shop owner. And when my guests come, they go to the shop owner and say, we're here visiting Jane. And he gives her the, them the keys, and they go up. So there's these, these benefits that you can't, you can't, there's no amount of money in the world that can reproduce those kinds of benefits. And in the, at the opposite extreme, do you remember the story about Trayvon Martin? Um, and so this is, this is very relevant. Uh, in the 70s, uh, Donald Appleyard at Berkeley did a study of uh, how many social connections, how does traffic have an impact on the social connections within a block? And he did this architectural analysis, right? These are architectural drawings that document the, <clears throat> the impact of traffic on the degree of social connections in a neighborhood. Architecture has a role to play in the social well-being of a neighborhood. Now, the space of the automobile is, this is, now we're moving into very fundamental architectural. These are things you're going to face in the first year of your practice, if you haven't already faced it in your internships, which is, the client comes to the architect and says, I need a building for my business. And what's the question that the architect asks? How many employees do you have? And the client says, let's say the client says 100 employees. Um, and so uh, the architect says, because uh, the architect is good at math and has a quick mind, the architect says, well, the gross square footage per employee is, and write this down, 350 square feet per employee. So the architect is really good at math. And so 350 square feet times 100 employees, that's, um, wait, don't tell me. How much is that? Okay, 35, tell me. 35,000. That is correct. So 35,000 square feet. Wow, I'm glad I came to the architects because they know just with that one bit of information they now uh, can tell me how big my building, how much square footage my building needs, and what's the cost of construction? Uh, well, how much is that going to cost? Well, you also know what the cost per square foot is of the market that they're building in, and you right away you give them the cost. This is how much your building's going to going to cost, more or less. Wow, I'm so glad I hired an architect to do this building. 
the next question the architect asks is, um, do how do your employers how do your employees get to work? This is actually a bigger, more important has a bigger impact. Before I can tell you how much this is going to cost you, you have to tell me how your employees get to work. If your employees take the T to work, then we're done. 35,000 square feet, that's it. If, however, your employees drive to work, how much space per employee does it take to accommodate the car of your employee? Yeah, like 180. 180? Square feet. Per, so you're, per you're, car. you're looking at the cars. Yeah, that's good. That's a good start. It's higher than that because when you did the 350 square feet per employee, you did their cubicle, which is only 80 square feet, right? Mm -hmm. The cubicle is 80 square feet. The corridor to get to the cubicle adds some. The kitchenette, the conference room, the bathrooms, the utility spaces, the structural core, the elevator. That's how we get from, a, from the 80 square feet of the cubicle to 350 square feet per employee gross, right? So same thing with the car. The parking space is eight feet by 20 feet. So that's, yeah. But how about the driveway to get to the car? Okay, it adds more. And how about, uh, you know, the entryway, the, you know, all of this stuff, 450 square feet. It's more than the, than the space and cost of the employee. Now, if you have employees, and if your piece of land, if your if your piece of land is expensive, uh, your employees you can stack up in multiple floors because we have elevators. They take up very small space. We need elevators anyway because of Americans with Disabilities Act since 1992. You have to have elevators if you have even you know a little bit of a rise. So, and you guys are doing this in studio now. You know all about this stuff. And so you need, you can stack employees till the cows come home. But how about their cars? You can stack their cars, right? Yeah. As soon as you stack one car above the other car, you go from 450 square feet per car to 750 square feet per car. Wow. Oh my God. You can't afford that. Let's keep all the cars on the ground level. So let's say you have a store that's 1,000 square feet. Well, let's say it's uh, 10,000 square feet. So it's a store that's 10,000 square feet. The zoning code of the town will allow this to continue even though the parking requirements have increased. But if you're going to build a new store, you can't do that. Right? We like the, as architects, we like the, the urban form of the streetcar suburb. And we kind of want to repeat that because Back at Wentworth, all my professors said, this is a good way to build cities. But then you show up, and you, you're not allowed. It's illegal. You can't do that. You have to provide parking as a ratio. You have to provide a certain number of spots for every uh, few hundred square feet of your store. In big retail malls, it's one spot for 1,000 square feet. But in a situation like this, it might be one spot for every 400 square feet of store. And if you are doing it in a place like Brookline, they keep, they keep increasing the parking requirement till the number of parking spots is, the space of the parking spots is huge compared to the space of the store. This is a fundamental problem of geometry, which is what we're good at as architects, right? We've talked about, I think we talked about how South Africa, who lived in South Africa? Um, we think we talked about how South Africa and the United States were the same, had the same more or less uh, discrimination and segregation policies. But then in 1949, the Nationalist Party won the election in South Africa, and they went deep into grand apartheid. We're going to make laws that control where people can walk or stand based on their race. And in the United States, the Supreme Court said, not so much. And they started doing Brown versus Board of Education. You can't segregate schools. And then we have the civil rights movement in the 60s. They knew how to do architectural visualizations. And they said, wait a minute. We're not so comfortable what you're doing here in Amsterdam. You're taking our canals, right? Amsterdam's 
beautiful canal city. You're taking our canals and you're filling them in so that you can widen the roads and make space for parking. If you, when you go to the Jordan, you'll see these amazing canals and these tiny little streets filled with bicycles and the cars, when you see a car, you, they'll be so careful because if a car is stopped and a bicyclist careens around the corner and bashes into the car, legally it's the car's fault. And so the cars are hypersensitive and they don't want to get in any conflicts with any bicyclists. And so, uh, but how did it get this way? But then you'll go around the corner and there's this huge parking lot in the Jordan, the, the most amazing neighborhood of Amsterdam, which you're going to see. And you're probably going to rent bicycles to get around Amsterdam. But you're going to see this weird thing. All of a sudden, there's this big, wide street with a lane on either side and all this parking in the middle. There's some great bike shops just around the corner on Hochstraat. But um, you'll see this. And you'll say, whoa, 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 what's this? Well, this is what Amsterdam was doing to make space for cars. They were filling in the canals. Well, these guys, including the architects, said, we've got to stop this. So they did this little architectural analytical exercise that proved to be extremely convincing. And when you go on this bike tour, you have to tell everyone else who's there with you this story and maybe get these images so you can show them. They did this thing. They filled a, a typical street in Amsterdam <clears throat> with cars, traffic. Here are the human bodies of those cars. <clears throat> This is how much space is taken up by each human body at the closest possible packing, back when cars used to be small. Um, and here's the same exercise with a bus. Completely different spatial arrangement. Let's keep that going. Let's put everyone on a proper Dutch bicycle. And here's the space. Look at that when they're carrying their kids in front. And here's how much space the bicycles take up. Let's do the same thing with pedestrians. Here's the pedestrians, and here's how much space the pedestrians take up. So they go from 100% gridlock, 100% of the space is taken up, to zero. That's pretty dramatic. That's architecture at work. This is what we do. So in 1934, they built the first freeway system in the United States, first freeway in the, in the United States between Los Angeles and Pasadena. They did it to eliminate the traffic jams that were forming on the local roads. And it worked beautifully. No, it went from horrible traffic jams to zero traffic jams. It's like zoom. And it worked beautifully for four months. And what, what happened then? They discovered a phenomenon that is now called induced traffic. When you build it, they will come. When a new road opens up, or when you widen the road, you know, it took billions of dollars, it took uh, three years of traffic jams to do the construction, and phew, we added a lane. Oh, OK, we're all set. It works beautifully for about six months on average in the United States. And then you get the traffic jams are back because people adjust their route decisions to uh, accommodate that and they reproduce the exact same degree of congestion that they had previously. This is surprising. To, it's a, what's surprising, the most surprising thing about this is that people are still surprised. 1934 was a long time ago. The engineers <clears throat> made up the word induced traffic halfway through 1934, right? We knew about this as the second we had this road, the same year, and yet we still keep doing it. And yet it's obvious to everyone we know. I'm a licensed professional. I have a driver's license. So I know that when I'm stuck in traffic, it's like, ah, they should build more roads. And when I'm looking for parking and I can't find parking, we know what the solution is. They should build more parking. So what happened on that small scale of the store, where the store, the 10,000 square foot store, became a 5,000 square foot store, became a 3,000 square foot store, 
That's what happened in cities all over the United States. This is downtown Houston, where to get the right balance between roads and parking, you had to uh, reduce uh, between buildings and parking. You stack up your employees, 350 square feet per person, and you spread out your parking spaces, 450 square feet per person, and this is the right balance. And this is what uh, it boils down to. This is a real place. This is not a science fiction movie. And it's basically, it's 85% roads and parking, 15% buildings by footprint. Notice how subtle the colors are? It's nice, right? It's pretty. The same image that I've been using, but analyzed differently to tell a different story. Shopping malls. So this is driven, remember this? This is the American dream. It's driven in part by cultural forces that you're familiar with because you knew who was cool and not cool in your high school. <clears throat> and it has implications for housing patterns. This is John Travolta's house. The logic of the automobile suburb has been extended to the logic of the airplane suburb. The suburbs wouldn't exist if it weren't for cheap oil. Um, the U.S. is a car culture. The automobile industry started in the U.S. And really, the automobile industry got, it got its start here because we were looking for ways to use that cheap oil. The U.S. was awash in oil in the early 20th century. In the 1930s, they were discovering the stuff so fast that um, oil in Texas was cheaper than drinking water by the car load. Still is. The car companies quickly became the engine-driving U.S. industry and economic growth. The result of this is that uh, we have created this new system of habitation where people live miles and miles from where they work and from where they get their food and all of, all of their other necessities based on the idea that they can and they must hop in their car at any moment and, and travel miles and miles. And the only way that works is on the basis of, of cheap energy. Now we're stuck up a cul-de-sac in a cement SUV. James Howard Kunstler. Uh, with an empty gas tank. Hilarious. Everything from our trains and buses, our cars and trucks, our heating in the winter months and cooling in the summer, all are dependent on cheap and reliable fossil fuel energy. And there is no other way of life that uses more of this energy than suburbia. So the suburban explosion uh, boosted the vehicle miles driven that peaked at 2005 and went down after that, in part because of the uh, Great Recession. Car ownership did the same thing, but now it's coming back up. But not at the level it was before. It turns out that uh, peak automobile ownership in the United States has something like 760 cars per thousand people. And a weird thing is happening in real estate, that real estate values are going up, dependent in part by how walkable a, a neighborhood is. And so the thing like walkability scores are having a serious impact on the value of real estate. So the more walkable it is. And so things seem to, seem to be turning around. And there's a complete streets movement. When you started going to school at Wentworth, there were no bicycle lanes anywhere near campus. Uh, and there were no bicycle lanes anywhere uh, in Boston or Cambridge, or there were few in Cambridge. But during your time in school, huge parts of Boston were transformed. It now feels like Amsterdam. There's all these bike lanes everywhere still nothing anywhere near campus. Most dangerous place of my daily commute is within a half mile of this classroom. I, 
I freeze up, I let all the cars go, and I wait till there's a red light, and then I get on my bike and I ride. I'll wait as long as it takes to clear the road because people are insane within a half mile of this classroom. After that, it gets quite pleasant and wonderful. Favorite part of the day, very relaxing. Now this has gone, we're, we're now gonna take a sweep through a very quick two minute tour of the rest of the world because we've already studied this. I'm just now connecting the dots to link this topic with LA School, American Dream Overseas, and uh, the Anthropocene. This is the car ownership rate as of 1995 in the United States. It went up like this. And then at that point, what were other cities, I mean, other countries in the world, what was their car ownership rate? The biggest countries in the world, China, India, and Indonesia are all down here. But that changes very quickly, uh, in part because of foreign aid. Who's lived in Bangkok? So the, uh, How's the traffic in Bangkok? Crazy. It was the worst in the world because the Japanese, maybe I'll save this story for next time, but the, Jap the long story short, the Japanese have said foreign aid that the U.S. gave to us after World War II, we now understand why that's kind of cool. We don't want to build roads in Japan because it would cripple our economy, but We've been building all these jeeps and trucks for the U.S. military to fight their war in Korea uh, during the 50s. And when the war in Korea ended, what are we going to do with all this excess industrial uh, capacity? We're not going to suburbanize Japan. We're not idiots. right? Japan is small with a high population density. We worship the trees and the rocks. We're not going to destroy our country just to keep our auto industry going. Let's destroy other countries. Let's destroy Thailand. Let's give them foreign aid. We'll give them millions, billions, so that they can hire us to engineer their road system and build their road system. As long as the money we give them, they give back to us um, to build those road systems. You're welcome, Thailand. And so Thailand built aggressively one of the most extensive road systems the world has ever seen after the United States. And then Japan sold, what kind of cars do you drive in Thailand? They're all Japanese, some American, right? But they even located their plants to satisfy. It worked so brilliantly that they offered money to all of the countries. And now here are the ring roads built by the Japanese foreign aid program. Thank you very much. Japan suppressed automobile production and ownership, ownership in Japan and amplified it and encouraged it and financed it everywhere else to the point where Bangkok was crippled in the 90s. You could not do anything in Bangkok in the 90s because the traffic was no good. So the Japanese said, we'll give you tens of millions of dollars, we'll give you billions of dollars to build the sky train, the skyway, right? The trains in Bangkok. Oh, yeah. And so those are all Japanese finance. So it's like, uh, Heroin is, you know, you're not getting enough. Here's some, here's some uh, meth, right? It's, it's that kind of a economic model. And thus the results are epic failure. And now China is building uh, a replica of the interstate highway system across Asia. And its new Belt and Road Initiative It's the biggest infrastructure push uh, in human history. It, it even was bigger than the U.S. interstate highway system. They took their, their blueprint for this push from U.S., from the U.S. automobility, uh, the success, quote unquote, of the U.S. system. So now, this is a clear example of how the U.S. continues to set the standard for what happens elsewhere in the world, and it has a lot of impacts. During your careers, this campaign will transform global geopolitics. It already has transformed global geopolitics. China is taking over Africa in order to produce food for export to China, even while Africans starve to death.
uh, and this is the shape of things to come. And we at least told a story that we're nice and ethical. China is not burdened with that kind of a, a story about itself. Um, so it doesn't have to slow down. There's no, and they, they have a way of controlling dissident voices in China that will prevent um, people from critiquing what China does in the next century. Okay? So that's all the time we have. Have a nice day. Thank you.